And praise the name of the Lord our God. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth, the eighth book uh, in your Bible. It is great to be back at Inglewood. I did serve here as interim pastor over 20 years ago. I was about uh, 15 years old at the time, and uh, to say that it was a wonderful blessing in my life at that time is an understatement. And so I'm really, really uh, blessed uh, to be back here today. Um, I have visited the Inglewood website, and I've seen uh, some of the guys that have been preaching over recent months, just awesome, awesome preachers. And I, I do fear that uh, after hearing me, you'll be sort of like that uh, Sesame Street song, you know, uh, one of these things is not like the others, uh, that uh, you'll uh, face a, a great contrast here. But of course, our purpose in this time of worship is to hear God speak to us, and God speaks to us through His Word, the Bible, and my role is to uh, explain uh, the Bible and apply it uh, to our lives. May I say um, at the beginning that um, all of us uh, face suffering. All of us go through times of uh, difficulty. Um, suffering has been a part of this world ever since sin has been a part of this world. Suffering is the consequence of sin. Sometimes we suffer because of our own sin. Sometimes we suffer because uh, others sin against us. Sometimes we suffer because of the universal presence of sin in our world and its universal effects. The tragedy of last night is just one example of a long list of examples that could be given of the fact that our world is fallen and broken. Um, follow along with me as I read, beginning in the first verse of the book of Ruth, and uh, I'll read the entire first chapter. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malan and Kilian died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. In other words, she heard that the famine was over. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. In other words, go back, remarry. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will remain with you, uh, or re return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that, you may become, that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. 
And she said, See, your, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, a name that means bitter or bitterness. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for your perfect word. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit who inspired it would help us to understand it and to live it this day by your power in us. I pray, Lord, that you would use your word to sanctify the church, to draw the lost to faith in Jesus. We do pray in his name. Amen. Those of us who are old enough remember where we were and what we were doing on September 11, 2001, when we heard that planes had been flown into the World Trade Center in New York City. Uh, Lisa Beamer certainly remembers. Her husband Todd was on the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. Uh, he was the one who led some other passengers to storm the terrorists that took the plane down and thereby saved a lot of people, preventing the plane from being flown into another building. Lisa remembers listening to the newscasters describe that event. The plane, they said, was headed for Chicago. That couldn't be Todd's plane because he was headed for San Francisco. But then later, a newscaster corrected that information and said that plane had been uh, bound for San Francisco. This is Lisa Beamer's account of uh, the next few minutes of her life. No, I screamed helplessly at the television. Without a shred of hard evidence, I knew intuitively that Todd was on that flight. I fell to my hands and knees and gasped. I made my way to my bedroom and sat down on the edge of the bed in a near catatonic state. Surely this can't be happening, I thought. It must be a bad dream. Todd can't be gone. Maybe, maybe there's some mistake. I thought of our boys, David and Drew, who loved their dad so dearly. I needed Todd. In that dark moment, my soul cried out to God. And he began to give me a sense of peace. But even that comfort did not take away the wrenching pain or the awful sense of loss I felt. We just read an account in the first chapter of Luke of another woman whose husband died, leaving her with two sons. Her name was Naomi, and this was her ground zero. Verse 1 says the events in the book of Ruth took place uh, in the days when the judges Ruled. Those days are described in the biblical book of Judges. Many people have referred to this period of Israel's history as the dark ages of Israel's history. Israelites were killing and stealing and 
raping. These were supposed to be God's people who were obeying God's law, but they uh, had turned away from God's law, and twice the book of Judges describes the spiritual condition of that time with these words. Everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes. Everybody did what they wanted to do. And to one degree or another, couldn't that be said of virtually every period in human history? Everybody doing what they wanted to do instead of what God tells us to do. Certainly, we can say of our own culture today that it is fallen and it is broken. So the book of Ruth is reminding us that in hard times, in all the times of our lives, we'll have to live in a depraved society. The people of Israel we're supposed to obey the law of God. But during this period of the judges, they were doing uh, just what everybody else was doing. They were surrounded by pagan Canaanites, and they were supposed to be different from the Canaanites. But they were living just like the Canaanites, even worshiping false gods. There were times of spiritual apostasy, moral degeneracy, rebellion against God and against His Word. That's the setting for the events recorded in the book of Luke. But, but the book of Ruth th does not describe all of that. The book of Ruth is about uh, one family and certain events in that family. The first verse of the book says that Elimelech went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The decision to move to Moab was a pivotal moment in Elimelech's family. It led to enormous consequences in, in hard times. It is true that our decisions can determine our destiny. Elimelech made this decision to move to Moab. Was it a good decision? The reason for that move was the famine in Bethlehem where Elimelech's family lived. And some people say, well, good for Elimelech. He moved his family so that they could have food. He rescued his family. But that opinion overlooks the first seven books of the Bible. People of Israel were not in Canaan by accident. That was the promised land, the land God had promised to give to his people, promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the land God had given to his people under Joshua, and God commanded that his people were to be there and stay there, and every family in Israel had a piece of that land allotted to them. They were not to buy it. They were not to sell. They were not to give it away. That's where God intended them uh, to be. And uh, Elimelech, though, Thought he had a plan that was better than God's plan, so he abandoned the land that God had given to him. And of all places, he moved to Moab. Moab was an enemy of Israel. During this period of the Judges, the Moabites had been oppressors of Israel. When Israel was on their way to the Promised Land, Moab had cursed Israel. Moab was a place where the people worshipped the god Chemosh, as well as other gods. And they even practiced child sacrifice. Moab was not having a famine, though, so the grass must have looked greener to, to Elimelech. But Moab was hardly a desirable location to a family who worshipped the one true God. As Irma Bombeck used to say, the grass is always greener over the septic tank. And that was Moab. Moab was the spiritual, moral, septic tank, and that's where Elimelech took his family. He left the land that God had given to his people. He left worship with the people of God. He left the fellowship of the people of God to take his family to a place where they would be surrounded by worshipers of a false god. Moab was only about 50 miles east of Bethlehem, so it was convenient, but it was also wicked. And some people say, well, that there was a famine. They had to live. But that's not true. They didn't have to live. As God's people, 
we don't make our decisions based on physical survival. We don't have to live, but we do have to die. And when we die, we have to stand before God and give an account as to whether we were faithful to believe and obey His Word. Elimelech's decision was not good. It reminds me of a cartoon somebody sent to me. A woman was talking on the phone and she said, I don't know, I'll ask my husband. He's in charge of all the bad decisions in our family. Uh, That was Elimelech. He was in charge of this bad decision in his family. Everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes and evidently Elimelech fit right in. He was doing the same. Moving to Moab seen right in his eyes and so that's what he did. Here's what we have to ask ourselves. Uh, Are my decisions based on God's Word or based on what I want? For, For followers of Jesus, that's a really important question because we're not called to convenience. We're called to obedience. We're not called to serve ourselves. We're called to serve God and others. The name Elimelech means my God is king. And that name is doubly ironic. First of all, Elimelech Elimelech lived in a time and place where there was no king in Israel, but his name was a reminder that there was a king in Israel. My God is king. But it was also ironic in the fact that his name said, my God is king. He's the ruler of my life. God wants me to remain in Canaan, but it's hard in Canaan. I'd like to move. Let's go. So his name was my God as king, but in actual fact, he was the ruler of his own life. Naomi means pleasant or sweet. Once they were in Moab, Elimelech died. The Bible doesn't tell us the cause of death. Maybe, you know, heart attack, stroke, maybe hit by a camel. We we don't know. But what we do know is that the very reason they had moved to Moab was to avoid death. And it was also ironic that when they went, death followed them and Elimelech died there. The book of Ruth also teaches us that in hard times we may see suffering in our family. And of course, Elimelech's death was a great tragedy for Naomi. The death of a husband or wife is always terrifically painful. It's always hard. But at least Naomi still had her sons, right? They could provide for her. But Malan and Kilian married Moabite women, uh, lived for 10 years, and then they died too. Think about the extent of Naomi's suffering. Her family had endured a famine, Then they moved to a country where they were immigrants in a land where people spoke a different language and worshipped false gods. And in that strange land, Naomi's husband died. Her two sons got married, but she had to attend their weddings without her husband at her side. But at least she would have grandchildren to bring joy to her life. But after ten childless years, the lives of her sons ended not with a positive pregnancy test, but with the horrific nightmare of every parent, the death of her two sons. And Naomi must have thought what every parent thinks at such a time. It's not supposed to be this way. A parent is not supposed to attend the funeral of her child, but Naomi had to do that twice. She had to grieve over the grave of her husband, and then she had to grieve over the grave of both of her sons. It's difficult for people today to appreciate what that meant for Naomi. Um, In a patriarchal, agrarian society, women were dependent on men in their lives to provide. If a husband died, a woman would depend on her sons to provide. Uh, But Naomi's sons died too. 
And it wasn't like she could go out and take a computer class, you know, and uh, develop a marketable skill and, and get a career. No, in that time, a woman's living, her, her career, her vocation was her family. And so when Naomi's entire family died, her life's work was obliterated. Uh, she was left with no means of support. This is the reason that Naomi has been called the female Job of the Bible. Her husband and children had died. She had no means of support, no grandchildren, and she was living among the enemies of God. Then there's the next chapter in Naomi's life, and that chapter shows us that in hard times, we can demonstrate loyalty. The famine ended. Naomi and her daughters-in-law began to go back to Bethlehem, and as they went, they talked with one another, talking about their lives, and they were crying. Verse 9 says they lifted up their voices and wept, and verse 14 says they wept again. So these ladies are talking about their lives, they're crying, they're, they're passing hankies around, and in that context is when we see Naomi issue a gracious command. Let's see what she did, because we can demonstrate loyalty too. Uh, by giving a gracious command. Naomi told her daughters-in-law to return to Moab. And at first, both Orpah and Ruth resisted the command. They said, in effect, hey, we're close. We, we'll figure this out. We, we've been through a lot together. Uh, we can stay together. But verse 8 says that Naomi said to them, go. Naomi had nothing for them. No money, no sons, no, no means of support. So she said, go home. In fact, she used the uh, imperative form of the word return four times. Return, 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 return. It was a gracious command because Naomi was thinking about what was best for them, not what was best for her. And what was best for Orpah and Ruth? What was best for them uh, would be to remarry. It didn't seem like any Jewish men in Bethlehem would be ready to marry uh, a Moabitess who were, was coming in, into town. And, uh, of course, Naomi had no sons to offer, although she did say, okay, let, let's think this through a minute, ladies. Uh, what if I were to marry right now, get pregnant tonight? Are you going to wait 15 years for my son to be old enough for you to marry? No, that's not a good plan. You need to go home. Go back to your people and find a husband among the Moabites. Don't worry about me. Think about your future. Don't let your husband's funeral be the final chapter of your life. Go home. It was a gracious command, and Orpah took her up on it. Orpah went home. And at that point, Ruth made her statement of loyalty. Uh, she shows us how to demonstrate loyalty by making a gutsy commitment. Once Orpah left, Naomi tried again to get Ruth to return. And this time she applied a little peer pressure. She said, look, Orpah has gone back. You go back like her. But Ruth didn't budge. And then she spoke the immortal words recorded in verses 16 and 17. They were words of loyalty, commitment. Ruth was literally standing at a fork in the road. Go back to Moab and worship Chemosh and other Moabite gods. Or go with Naomi to Bethlehem. Worship the one true God. She said to Naomi, Where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. It was a physical commitment. Committing herself to be with Naomi, no matter what. She also said, Your people shall be my people. That was a social commitment. Ruth was committing herself to be with Naomi's people, the Jews. She was a Moabitess. She was saying, I'll become a Jew as well. To the Jews, the Moabites were the enemy. It was a gutsy move for Ruth to cross that social and cultural barrier to make a commitment to Naomi's people. It was also a spiritual commitment. She said, your God, 
my God. Orpah had done just the opposite. Did you notice? Verse 15, Naomi said to Ruth, Your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Orpah returned to the worship of Chemosh, the false god, the worship of her youth. But Ruth abandoned the religion of her youth and embraced the one true God and His covenant people. Your God, my God, she said. It would be impossible to exaggerate the gravity of Ruth's commitment. She made the decision to abandon everything she had been taught growing up about religion and the gods. She made the commitment to abandon the beliefs of her family and her friends in order to put her faith in the one true God and to associate herself with the people of God. By the way, if you have yet to put your faith in the one true God and associate with His people, my prayer is that you will do so before this service is over. You'll have the opportunity to do it at the time of invitation, to put your faith in Jesus, the one and only Savior, to become a part of the family of God. Inglewood, may we never forget that it is God's holy intention to call all of the Ruths, the Moabites, to Himself to enjoy a relationship with Him forever. This is God's global call, God's worldwide agenda, and the Bible teaches that God's people are to join God's global call. In Ruth's case, for several reasons, it's amazing that she was willing to put her faith in the one true God. Think about the kind of witness Ruth had. Her connection with the Lord was the family of Elimelech. Elimelech, the man who disobeyed God and moved to Moab, and his sons, Malan and Kilian, two young men who disobeyed God and married Moabite women, women outside the faith. And then also Naomi, who was bitter at God, mad at him for the suffering that she had experienced in her life. In fact, Naomi hardly implored Ruth to be saved, right? She said to Ruth, look, Orpah went back to her gods. You go too. She wasn't exactly calling her to faith in the one true God, but that's the kind of witness Ruth saw. A dad and two sons who thought they had a better plan for their lives than God did, and a mom who thought God had mistreated her. And amazingly, Ruth said, sign me up for that. Your God my God. Listen, the book of Ruth reminds us that even in this wicked world, even with a compromised church and surely less than ideal witness, there are Ruths all over the place who are ready and willing to put their faith in the one true God if they will only hear the truth, however imperfectly it may be presented to them. That is one of the many realities that should compel the church of Jesus Christ to take the gospel to the nations. And now we're approaching something that is so important for us to learn from the first chapter of Ruth. In hard times, our circumstances will be a showcase of God's sovereignty. God is sovereign. He rules over all of the universe. And Naomi professed belief in the sovereignty of God. This is practical for us. Naomi interpreted her suffering as an expression of the sovereignty of God. Verse 13, she said, The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. God rules over everything in the universe. From the movements of vast spiraling galaxies to the movements of tiny spiraling electrons. And He rules over the events of my life and your life as well. Naomi realized that He 
rules over her life, even over her suffering. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Naomi, Naomi believed in the sovereignty of God, but we can have belief and bitterness. And Naomi described herself as bitter. Verse 19 says, At the, the arrival of Naomi and Ruth in Bethlehem, it created quite a stir in town. Naomi had left Bethlehem ten years earlier with a husband and two sons. She came back to Bethlehem with a young Moabite woman at her side. In a little Jewish town like Bethlehem, that doesn't happen every day. And so the town was all abuzz about it. You, hey, you'll never guess who walked into town today. You'll never guess who was with her. You'll never guess who was not with her. They said, is this Naomi? And they went to Naomi. Verse 20 and 21 says that she responded with bitter belief. Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi or pleasant or sweet? When the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. They ask, is this Naomi? It's been so long. How are you doing? And Naomi said, am I Naomi? Yes and no. I am that woman who left town ten years ago named Naomi. But don't call me that anymore because I'm not that woman anymore. The Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Naomi means pleasant or sweet and I may have been a sweetheart when I left but now I'm a bitter woman. The Lord has afflicted me. He's emptied my life of all that was precious to me. Before we left Bethlehem, he could have stopped the famine, but he didn't. After we arrived in Moab, he could have saved the life of my husband and my two sons, but he didn't do that either. Don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me bitter woman. This is the first time she had spoken to these people in over 10 years. She just came out and said that she was bitter and her suffering was God's fault. In that, she was like Job also. Job accused God of treating him badly and even said, the Almighty has made my soul bitter. I admire the honesty of Job and Naomi. I mean, I've read Ephesians 4 and Hebrews 12, and I know we're not supposed to be bitter, but my question is, what if we are bitter? What are we going to do with that? Our problem is that we aren't healed of it because we never admit it. At least Naomi came out and put it on the table. She admitted it. Our problem is we lie about it. People ask us, hey, how are you doing? Hey, fine, great. Everything's wonderful. God's good. Everything's good. It's all good. Naomi didn't do that. She just went to the people of God and said, I'm not doing fine. I, I've cried my eyes dry over what God has allowed to enter my life. I'm not an atheist. I believe in God. I believe He's sovereign. It's just that I'm furious with Him right now. I respect Naomi for her belief uh, in the sovereignty of God and for her honesty. But bitter belief, you see, can be blind. Naomi's bitter reaction to her suffering blinded her to certain truths about the nature of God, His purpose in her life, and certain facts as well. It's true that God is sovereign, so He allowed Naomi to suffer, but it was also true that members of her family had engaged themselves in sin, and their suffering had been the consequence of sin. Elimelech disobeyed the command of God. Uh, Malan and Killian also disobeyed the command of, of God. Commands that God had promised. He would bring His judgment. He would bring suffering on His people if they disobeyed those commands. If Naomi had remembered that, perhaps uh, she would not have been uh, bitter. 
but not remembering that. Her, and when we see that, her bitterness is sort of like a, a, a child who her, her parent tells her not to touch the hot stove, but she touches it anyway and is burned and then turns to her parent accusingly and says, why did you allow that to happen? We do that to God sometimes. And our own suffering is the result of sin. Elimelech, Malan, Killian, they were responsible for their own sinful choices, and suffering was the consequence of their sin. Evidently, Naomi's bitterness blinded her to that. And it also blinded her to certain attributes of God. She was right to profess belief in the sovereignty of God. She was wrong to fail to profess belief in the goodness of God and the love of God. God is not only in control, He also loves us. God is sovereign. He is also good and loving. He rules over everything, even suffering. He also loves us, and He is working everything for our good and toward His redemptive purpose in the end. In Bethlehem, God was going to provide abundantly for Naomi and Ruth. He would provide food for them. He would provide a husband for Ruth. He would provide a grandchild for Naomi. And of course, Naomi could not see all of that out in the future. We can never see our future, but God can see it. And so therefore, we can in the present put our trust in Him, knowing that He loves us and He is good to us. He's worthy of our trust. God was working in all the events of Naomi's life for His good purpose to bring salvation to the nations. To bring salvation to the nations. God had a providential plan in the lives of Naomi and Ruth, uh, even in this suffering. The result of their return to Bethlehem would be that Ruth would marry a man named Boaz. And Ruth and Boaz would have a son. And that son would be the grandfather of Israel's greatest king, King David. And therefore, that son would also be a forerunner of Israel's eternal king, Jesus the Messiah and Savior. God had a plan to use Naomi and Ruth. His plan was to use them in His redemptive purpose to offer salvation and eternal life to everybody in the world through Jesus. They could not have seen that far in the future, but they could have trusted God knowing that he knew what he was doing. We face the same choice in our hard times. We can bitterly believe in God's sovereignty and say, God, you could have stopped this. Or we can say, God, I have no idea why you allowed this suffering to enter my life, but I do know that you are good and you love me you know what you are doing, and so I'll trust you to use these hard times for your good plan. And by the way, that's exactly what Romans 8.28 says. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose I close this morning by returning to the words of Lisa Beamer. As she looked back on the events of 9-11 and reflected on the death of her husband and her own grief, she wrote, We all have the choice to become bitter or to become better. I have found, she wrote, security in a loving Heavenly Father in whom I can trust completely. Shall we pray? As we bow our heads in the presence of the Lord, maybe somebody here is facing suffering right now. This is a great time and a great place for you to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm hurting. 
And I don't understand everything that's happening in my life. But I'm going to trust you and follow you because I know you're good and I know you love me. Maybe somebody here is like Elimelech. My God is king. He's in, he's in charge of my life. And I'll call on him if I ever need him. But right now, I've got everything under control by myself. You need to turn your life over to him and obey his word before you make a decision that hurts you and a lot of other people in your life. Is somebody here like Ruth? You've got religion in your past. It's just that it's religion without a relationship with the one true God. You're not one of the people of God and you're at a fork in the road. Putting your faith in Jesus is that's an enormous step, but God loves you. And He wants to forgive you of sin and give you abundant eternal life and use you for His glory. Put your faith in Jesus, the Savior. Lord God, thank You for Your Word this morning. Thank You that You are here right now speaking to us. And I pray that all of us re respond to what You are saying to us, that that one without Jesus would respond to Your call to salvation in Him, that believer who's compromised would respond by obeying your word, that that suffering would, would respond by a renewed trust in you, renewed love for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That we do offer a time of uh, decision. We offer a time for if you've never put your faith in Jesus this morning, for you to do that. If you men will be here at the front, they would love to talk to you about how to follow Jesus, how to put your faith in Him. Or maybe Somebody here this morning is facing some difficult times and you want somebody to pray with you. These men are here for that or you can pray where you are. Maybe you know somebody who's suffering and this is a time of prayer for you to pray for them. Either where you are or here at the front, we invite you to respond to the Word of God. This morning as we stand and sing, we'll wait for you.